We're about to begin, and uh, thank you for coming out on a Friday uh, night of Memorial Day weekend and uh, for this uh, great event. My name is Roger Ginch, and I'm the senior pastor here at the New York Avenue uh, Presbyterian Church, and we're just delighted uh, to sponsor this event that has been part of a larger project on race and poverty in Washington, D.C., and I will tell you a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But as we begin, let us begin with prayer. O God of the Exodus, we are here tonight because we in America are indeed in a situation where liberation is needed in so many different ways. In light of uh, policies that continue to oppress, in light of a politics that is so polarized that they've forgotten the people, in light of um, a racism that manifests itself in so many hidden and visible ways, we are in need of a special presence here, a pillar of fire that goes before us, a parting of the waters. Indeed, we believe that we have come to a Sinai experience of understanding that as we address the key issues, America's original sin, as we seek to embrace the tragedy that is a part of our history and move beyond it with hope, as we seek to understand the cross and the lynching tree and how the lynching tree is a symbol for so many other tragedies that are right before us, that are in our face if we would only look and see it. As we seek your spirit and your presence, we are a people on a journey and we are grateful for this evening because it is a high moment, indeed a mountaintop moment, but it is still a journey on the way. And we are still embracing the possibility of the promised land. And as we uh, stand before Canaan and we seek uh, your presence in parting the waters, we know that we have a lot of work to do. And, oh God, we pray for your spirit that goads us, that challenges us, that shakes us to the core, and then gives us a grace and a forgiveness to become a people of reconciliation, indeed to become what Martin King called the beloved community. And that's what we seek to be, a taste of it here and now. And it is with these images, these words, and this power in mind that we uh, ask for your blessing as we pray all of these things in the name of Christ, the crucified and risen one. Amen. And now I would like to uh, introduce uh, Paul Dornan, who is part of the Scholar in Residence program that has... Uh, uh, in some ways been a part of the uh, core of, of this whole project that I will explain to you in uh, a moment. But Paul is going to explain a little bit of uh, what we're uh, doing here tonight and um, some of the details that uh, you'll need as we go through the evening and as we progress from this event on. So Paul Dornan. Good evening. Some details, <laughs> that's what I'm good at. Uh, bathrooms, uh, there is a bathroom through this door and um, on this floor there are women's and men's bathrooms on the first floor that can be achieved by going out either these doors or the back doors. Attendance, would you do us a great, great favor and sign your name in the hospitality pads that are in the center aisle and pass those along to everyone. If you could please give us your name and contact information 
in particular your email address. We will let you know of future events and what the initiative that, that Roger is going to describe to you uh, his, uh, will be doing, what the Scholar in Residence program is doing. Uh, so please fill that out. That's the only way that we're going to have uh, the information we need to contact you in the future. You may have picked up one of these building the mementos, momentums. Um, this is not our order of service for tonight, as you might have thought. It is the order of service when you leave this place. <laughs> so um, it's a suggested list of things that we can do um, not a complete list, but a list of things that we might do to follow up on the momentum that has been started in the last number of months. Um, we've had four congregations in the District of Columbia who have worshiped together and have had Lenten discussions on Dr. Cohn's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, four of those discussions. That was meant to be a start. Um, and so this is meant to suggest some ways that you can build on that momentum this summer. We don't have specific programming ourselves, but other people have programming. So we would very much like for you to pledge at least to yourself that you will do one or several of these steps so that we can keep building the momentum uh, of the initiative on race and class in Washington, D.C. So please, if you don't have a copy when you leave, take one. We will have a, um, the way this will be organized tonight is that, uh, that uh, Pastor Gensch will um, give us a short introduction um, there will be an introduction of Dr. Cohn. Dr. Cohn will lecture. And then we'll have a question and answer period. And I want to just give you a sense of what that question and answer period will be. You all have, um, there are note cards in your pews. I put them in there myself, so if there's any problem, it's, it's me that you should look for. But there are cards throughout. And so I'm hoping that as questions come up, uh, you will write them down and then we'll gather them and the pastors. I will not make the decision as to whose questions are going to be answered, but the pastors who are uh, highly qualified to do such things will be deciding how, how uh, which questions should be posed and then uh, Dr. Cohn will answer them. Um, and so that's the major programming tonight. Then we're going to have a book signing. Uh, Dr. Cohn is, has graciously agreed to sign books in the back. And um, we, as the Scholar in Residence Program, had given out already 150 copies of The Cross and Lynching Tree. And apparently there's still a demand in Washington, D.C. So uh, we're being told that we should have ordered more. So we'll, we'll figure out a way to have enough for you all. So pick up a coffee, have it signed by the author. Uh, and finally, we do offer, we will be offering history tours of this facility, of this uh, historical church after um, the, our meeting tonight. So anyone who would like a tour, there'll be several of us up front who can give tours uh, when, when and if you should uh, decide to take them. We're as pleased as we can be that you're all out here tonight. Thank you. Let me just set a little bit of a context for um, this event tonight becomes, because it comes in a stream of conversations that have been going on um, here uh, with uh, four churches now 
um, from January till now. But really, the conversation began uh, several years ago when I met Lionel Edmonds for the first time, and we started actually doing spirituality together, and somehow that got off on the topic of race in Washington, D.C. Race and um, the divisiveness um, and of, of, of the politics around race in D.C. and poverty, the two of them. Um, eventually, um, Joe Daniels became a part of that conversation, and now these two folk are uh, two of my very dearest colleagues and conversation partners. And we decided just to um, do it. Um, everybody talks about race, and everybody agrees that it's an issue, but um, it's painful how little people talk about it and go into it directly. And so what we decided to do was, back in January, to come together as three churches and have a choir um, uh, sing-off. <laughs> it actually wasn't a contest. It was, a, it was, it was the w most wonderful, um, diverse um, collection of choirs and songs and people that uh, most people here at New York Avenue can ever remember here. And it was amazing because it was the day before Martin Luther King's birthday, the, inaugura the second inauguration of uh, President Barack Obama, and there was absolutely no parking, period, and yet over 600 people showed up for that concert, 600 people. And we had a covenanting ceremony at that uh, concert where 150 people signed a covenant to read the cross and the lynching tree through the period of Lent and to come together on, of discussions on that book. Our first discussion was at Emory United Methodist. Joe Daniels led, led that discussion and created safe space for us to talk about race. The second one was here at New York Avenue Church. Uh, and by the way, 120 people showed up at that very first conversation. On a rainy, cold night, uh, 100 people showed up here for the second conversation. And then the third conversation took place at uh, Lionel Edmonds Church. Um, and uh, Lionel proceeded to do a community action on us and talked about the issue of jobs in Washington, D.C. and how it uh, disproportionately affects black people in the city. And then our fourth conversation was up at Luther Place with Karen Brow. Through the heart of all of these conversations, a transformation has taken place. And it is going to be an ongoing conversation that is uh, described in the handout that you've got. Uh, if you have not been a part of this conversation, we invite you into it. Uh, we have not tried to make this an exclusive conversation. Uh, it, it, in, in part, it has been under the auspices of the Washington Interfaith Network. And they have been very helpful in providing support and providing advertisement for the conversations. But we have invited a variety of other folk to come into these conversations. And if you're here and this is the first time you're hearing about it, then please know that this is going to be an ongoing uh, project. And if you'd like to be a part of this, just let us know. But that's all I wanted to do. I don't want to take any more time because I want to give the, the lion's share of the time to ob obviously our uh, esteemed um, uh, speaker here tonight. And so I'm going to invite Lionel Edmonds up to introduce uh, Dr. James Cohn. Lionel. Good evening. Professor James H. Cohn is the Charles A. Briggs Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary. He attended Shorter College and holds a BA degree from Philander Smith College. In 1961, he received a Master of Divinity degree from Garrett Theological Seminary and later earned an MA and PhD from Northwestern University. Among his numerous awards are the American Black Achievement Award in Religion given by Ebony Magazine, the Fund for Theological Education Award for Contributions to Theological Education and Scholarship, the Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion, 
Dr. Cohn is an ordained minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Dr. Cohn is best known for his groundbreaking works, such as Black Theology and Black Power, A Black Theology of Liberation. He is also the author of The God of the Oppressed and of Martin and Malcolm and America, A Dream or a nightmare. He has been called one of the great theologians of our time, Dr. Professor James H. Cohn. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here tonight and to participate in this discussion with you. It is always the highest respect that anyone can give me is to come together to talk about something that I have written. And especially to spend so much time discussing it before I get here. I am deeply honored that you invited me here for this occasion. I'm going to talk about my book. Uh, the title is Wrestling with the Cross and the Lynching Tree. People have often asked me, which one of my books is my favorite? And I really couldn't say. It was like choosing one of my four children. But with the cross and the lynching tree, I now have a favorite. I've also been asked, how long did it take you to write the cross and the lynching tree? The formal time was about 10 years of research, thinking, and writing. I wrote many drafts before it reached its present form. But in a deepest sense, I've been writing this book all my life. I put my whole being into it, mind, body, soul, and heart, and I didn't hold anything back. It was like I didn't choose to write it. The cross and the lynching tree chose me. I took my time and chose my words carefully as if the integrity of black faith and the freedom struggle that rose out of it were at stake. And I'm still writing it. And it will not be finished until I draw my last breath. I remember when I first sat down to write my first book more than 40 years ago. I didn't even know that I could write. But the fire of the civil rights movement and black power were burning deep inside me. And I had to let it out. As Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. <laughs> Bringing forth black theology and black power saved me from a meaningless theological career. It was a transforming experience empowering me to write with clarity and power that even surprised me. 
And since that Kairos moment, I have been writing and thinking and reading almost daily, trying to make sense out of how African Americans survived and resisted four centuries of the terror of white supremacy. The cross and the lynching tree is a special moment in my theological journey. This book engaged me like no other subject. For years, I have been wrestling with the great paradox of Jesus' crucifixion and the lynching of African Americans in my classes at Union, in lectures and sermons at seminaries, colleges and universities and churches and community groups, and even on TV and radio shows and with anyone who would listen. The more I researched and wrote, the more I realized that this book had to be written with the most creative theological imagination that I could muster and with the best prose that I could create. The subject was too important for a half-hearted, second-rate theological effort. I often wondered whether I had the literary talent to write the kind of book that the subject deserved. I'm not James Baldwin or Toni Morrison, and I only have so much writing talent. And as I was writing, I prayed to God of the universe to give me the wisdom, the insight, and especially the courage to write the truth about the black religious experience in the United States. Amen. I hope that I have written a book that bears witness to black people's struggle for justice, and to the faith that empowered and sustained them in their fight against great odds. Without qualifications, I can honestly say that I did my best. To do less would have been a theological sin. The question that I have been wrestling with is this. How did African Americans survive and resist the lynching terror and also keep enough of their sanity to love and marry each other, to raise their children, and to teach them to love and respect each other? The answer is clear. It was their faith in God and in themselves that kept them emotionally and spiritually healthy enough to love not only themselves and each other, but even the whites who lynched them. What an amazing ethical accomplishment. Whites use Christianity to lynch blacks, and blacks used it to survive and to resist whites. The more I reflected on the cross and the lynching tree, the more I understood why black Christians could not turn away from the cross even though whites used that cross to enslave, segregate, and lynch them. As James Baldwin said, white people discovered the cross by way of the Bible, but black people discovered the Bible by way of the cross. This is the great paradox in black life. And my reason for wrestling with this paradox 
are found in my book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, to which I now turn to read three quotations. One from Acts 10.39, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. The other is from an account of lynching. Hundreds of Kodaks clicked all the morning at the scene of the lynching. People in automobiles and carriages came from miles around to view the corpse of the dang the corpse dangling from the end of a rope. Picture card photographers install a portable printing plant at the bridge and reap a harvest in selling postcards showing the photograph of the lynch negro. Women and children were there by the score. At a number of the country schools, the day's routine was delayed until boy and girl pupils could get back from viewing the lynch black man. Unquote. That's the lynching of Thomas Brooks, June the 2nd, 1915, in Fayette County, Tennessee. And the third quotation is from the introduction of my book, the first paragraph. The cross and the lynching tree are separated by nearly 2,000 years, one is the universal symbol of the Christian faith, and the other is the quintessential symbol of black oppression in America. Though both are symbols of death, one represents a message of hope and salvation, while the other signifies the negation of that message by white supremacy. Despite the obvious similarities between Jesus' death on the cross and the death of thousands of black men and women strung up to die on a tree, relatively few people, apart from black poets, novelists, and other reality seeing artists, have explored the symbolic connections. Yet, I believe, this is the challenge we must face. What is at stake is a credibility and promise of the Christian gospel and the hope that we may heal the wounds of racial violence that continues to divide our churches and our society. Now, I have spent a lifetime pointing out the hypocrisy and the mendacity of white church in a white-dominated society while lifting up and exalting the voices and the experiences of the oppressed. I write out of my experience as an African-American growing up in segregated Arkansas and a close association with the civil rights and black power movements in the 1960s, defined by Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. But more importantly, I write out of a deep theological conviction that the true power of the Christian gospel is its unambiguous call for liberation from the forces of oppression and a fierce and uncompromising condemnation of all who oppress. I write on behalf of those whom the Salvadorian theologian and martyr Ignacio Elia Curia called the crucified people of history. I write for the forgotten and the abused, the marginalized and the despised. I write 
for those who are penniless, jobless, landless, and who have no political or social power. I write for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and those who are transgender. I write for undocumented farm workers toiling in misery in our nation's agricultural fields. I write for Muslims who live under the terror of war and empire in Iraq, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And I write for all people who care about humanity. I believe that until white Americans, and especially theologians and Christians, all Americans really, can see the cross and the lynching tree together, until we can identify Christ with a re-crucified black body hanging from a lynching tree, there can be no genuine understanding of Christian identity in America and no deliverance from the brutal legacy of slavery and white supremacy. As I started reading about lynching and about the historical situations of the crosses in Rome during the time of Jesus, my question was, how did African Americans survive and resist this lynching terror? How did they do it? There were nearly 5,000 African-American men, women, and children who were lynched in America following the Civil War, and their devastated families were left behind to cope with their great loss. To live every day under the terror of death was no easy matter. I grew up in Arkansas a lynching state. I know from experience something about lynching. I watch my mother and father deal with it. But the moment I read about it, examining it historically, I had to ask how in the world did blacks survive? How did they keep their sanity in the midst of all that terror. I discovered as strange and as paradoxically as it may appear, it was the cross. It was their faith in Jesus' cross, believing that if God was with Jesus, God must be with us because we are up on crosses too. My other question was, how could white Christians who say they believe that Jesus died on the cross to save them, how could they then turn around and put blacks on crosses and crucify them just like the Romans crucified Jesus? That was an amazing paradox to me. African Americans use their faith to survive and resist, while whites use faith in order to terrorize black people. Two communities, both Christians, embracing the same faith. Whites did lynchings on church grounds. How could they do it? That's where my passion came from as I wrote this text. That's where the paradox came from. That's where my theological wrestling came from. Many Christians celebrate the conviction that Jesus died on the cross to redeem humankind from sin. Taking our place, they say, Jesus suffered on the cross and gave his life as a ransom for many. The cross is this great symbol of the Christian narrative of salvation. But unfortunately, during the course of 2,000 years of Christian history, the cross as a symbol of salvation has been detached 
from the ongoing suffering and oppression of human beings, the crucified people of history. The cross has been transformed into a harmless, non-offensive ornament that Christians wear around their necks. Rather than reminding us of the cost of discipleship, it has been transformed into cheap grace, as Bonhoeffer put it, an easy way to salvation that doesn't force us to confront the power of Christ and his mission. Now, if theologians like Reinhold Niebuhr could ignore, ignore lyn lynching and white supremacy, I contended there must be something defective in their understanding of the faith itself. If it weren't defective, then white Christians wouldn't put black people on crosses. Therefore, Niebuhr and other religious thinkers wouldn't have been silent about it. I look around and I see the same thing happening today in the prison industrial complex, which Michelle Alexander called the new Jim Crow. You can lynch people by more than just hanging them on a tree. You can incarcerate them. How long will this terror last? In writing this book, I found my inspiration in black ministers like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, along with writers such as James Baldwin, Abbott Camus, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, and Richard Wright, as well as the great blues artists of my youth. These ministers, artists, and writers, not the white theologian, gave me a sense of awe in the presence of humanity, fighting for justice against great odds. I saw that the most ordinary blacks, for them it was the blues and religion that offered them the cheap weapons of resistance. It was their religion and the blues that offered sources of hope that there was more to life than what one encountered daily in a white man's world. In other words, in the words of the great poets and writers and in the blues singers and in the thunderous voices and services of the black church, I discovered those who were able to confront the bleak circumstances of their lives and yet defy fate and suffering and make the most of what little life had to offer them. Through these connections, I found my voice, which burst forth in black theology and black power. I understood that when people do not want to be themselves, but somebody else, that is utter despair, a sickness unto death. And I knew that faith informed by the blues was the one thing that white people could not control or take away from African Americans. As the great bluesman Robert Johnson put it, I got to keep moving. I got to keep moving. Blues falling like hell. And the day keeps on worrying me. There's a hellhound on my trail. After reading Baldwin Wright and Camus, I wanted to go back to graduate school and study 
literature and get another Ph.D. at the University of Chicago in the 1960s. Under the tutelage of the Negro professor Nathan Scott, Jr., widely regarded as the creator and the leading scholar in theology and literature. Although Nathan Scott and I talked about it, the black freedom movement was too urgent for me to return to school. America's cities were burning, and black people were being shot down in the street. I said to myself, you already have a PhD. And if you ain't got nothing to say now, after six years of graduate study at Garrett and Northwestern, you ain't never going to have anything to say. <laughs> and I said, forget school. Sit yourself in that chair and write what you think. Now, although I wrote a doctoral dissertation on the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, I never taught a course on him because I like people who talk and write about the real concrete world where people are suffering. And unless I can feel it in my gut, I can't say it. The poor help me to say it because I feel their pain. The literary and the artist people help me to say it because they write about suffering with imagination and power. James Baldwin is my favorite. Martin King is next. And Malcolm X is the third person in my intellectual trinity. The poets and orators give me energy. Academic theologians talk about things far removed, way out there in some intellectual stratosphere, which only they inhabit. They talk to each other, they give each other degrees, and recommend each other for teaching positions in seminaries and universities. The real world is not where they live and think. So that is why I turn to the poets and the artists. They talk about people I know and love, the marginalized of the world. Being a Christian is somewhat like being black. It's a paradox, a profound contradiction. You grow up black, and you can't help but wonder why whites treat you like that. It's hard to figure that out, especially as an innocent child as I was in Arkansas. And yet at the same time, my mother and father told me, don't you hate like they hate. If you do, you will self-destruct, she said. Hate kills the hater, not necessarily the hated. It was my parents' faith that gave them and me the inner resources to transcend the brutality and to see the real beauty in the tragedy of their lives. It's a mystery, a profound and deep mystery how African Americans, after two and a half centuries of slavery, another century of lynching and Jim Crow segregation, and yet still come out loving white people. Now that's a profound ethical achievement. Yet the cross is that paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the good news that hope comes by way of defeat. That suffering and death do not have the last word. That the last shall be first and the first last. This idea is absurd to the intellect. 
yet profoundly real to the spiritual lives of black folk. For many of those who relents the crucified Christ manifest God's loving and liberating presence in the brutalities of black life. The cross of Jesus is that transcendent presence in the lives of black Christians that empower them to believe that ultimately in God's eschatological future they will not be defeated by the troubles of this world no matter how great and how painful their suffering. This paradox, this absurd claim of faith was not only possible, was only possible when one is stripped of power when one was unable to be proud and mighty, and when one understood that people were not called by God to rule over others. The cross was God's critique of power, white power, with powerless love snatching victory out of defeat. What I am talking about is like love. It's something you can't prove empirically or articulate adequately, but the truth of it is self-evident in living it. I have seen the transforming power of faith in the cross among black Christians who struggle, especially among black freedom rights writer, black freedom fighters in the civil rights movement. Many knew that they were going to die. They knew they were not going to win in the American way of winning. But they had to do what they had to do because the transcendent reality they encountered in their fight for justice was more powerful than the opposition, more meaningful than that which contradicted it. And unlike some blacks like James Baldwin in Harlem, I really don't ever remember wishing that I was white. Because being black and bearded at Macedonia AME Church was so wonderful and beautiful, especially as I saw blackness embodied in the lives of my mother and father and the host of other proud black men and women in Arkansas. The reality of love in my community there was so strong, so real, that I didn't have time to think about being white. The spiritual values of my parents and other blacks were so important that the material things I saw in the white world that hated me didn't matter. Black music, black preaching, black loving, black dancing, Everything black was much more interesting and inspiring. Blackness saved me from whiteness and kept me sane, believing that I was somebody. How do people know that they are not what the world says when they have so few social and political resources to defend their humanity. So few economic resources to even physically survive. And so few educational resources to express their somebodyness. For many blacks the US, in the US, it was their faith which was inseparable from their culture. That was why I call the blues secular spirituals. The blues are spiritual resources, a cultural power that enables black people to express their humanity. James Baldwin only finished high school. Richard Wright only the ninth grade. 
but they had their say and bore witness to a transcendence in blackness that no one could destroy. Blackness is the image of God in black people. It is the light in the white darkness. B.B. King never got out of grade school. And Louis Armstrong hardly went to any school at all. And I said to myself, if Louis Armstrong could blow a trumpet like that, forget it. I'm going to write theology the way Louis Armstrong blows that trumpet. And the way Billy Holiday sings strange fruit. I want to reach deep down in my black being for those cultural resources that enable African Americans to express themselves when the world said that they had nothing to say. People who resist oppression create hope and love for humanity. That's why I like to write about a faith that resists, faith that empowers, faith that enables people to look another in the eye and tell them what you think. I remember growing up in Arkansas that there were a lot of masks. As Paul Lund Lawrence Dunbar put it, we wear the mask that grins and lies. I wore a mask in Arkansas as a child when I went to the white people's town in Bearden and other places, but I didn't wear it in my own community. I wore a mask in a white community because I knew what they could do to me and my family. I wore a mask even in graduate school because I wanted to find a way to excel in an academic environment that refused to acknowledge my black existence. But I kept saying to myself, one of these days I'm going to take that mask off and say what I think to white people and make up for lost time. <laughs> and so, for the last 40 some years, that's what I've been doing. I write to encourage African Americans to take off their mask and to get in touch with their inner resources in order to have their say and to say it clearly, forcefully, and truthfully as you can. Now my mother and father, did not have my opportunity. So when I write and speak, I try to write and speak for them. They never had a chance to stand before white people, as I do, and tell them what they think. I've got to do that for them somehow. So I try to do that all over the world. I think of Lucy and Charlie Cone and all the other Lucys and Charlie Cones out there who cannot speak. I think of them and not so much of myself. I think of them and I feel their spirit flowing through my body, encouraging me to speak the truth. They deepen my spirituality and give me something to hold on to, something that I can feel deep in my being, giving me courage to speak the truth. It is a very spiritual experience because you are doing something for people you love who cannot and will never have a chance to speak in a context like this. So why do I need to speak for myself? 
I need to speak for people who cannot speak, for those people, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. If you feel passion in my voice, if you feel energy in my text, that's because I'm thinking of Lucy and Charlie, my mother and father, trying to do justice to their courage and their faith and all the things that they taught me. And as long as I can do that, I think I'll stay on the right track. Thank you. We give God thanks for such a powerful, powerful presentation. Can we affirm Dr. Cohn yet one more time? Can we? <laughs> my wife is, and I are, my wife is here with me tonight, and I don't know if this was recorded or not. Uh, if it was, I sure enough want to get a copy of it. Of all the places where our son, who just graduated from North Carolina A&T State University, is going to for graduate school to pursue a PhD, it's at the University of Arkansas <laughs> in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So we have some things to talk about after. <laughs> um, if you would be so kind as uh, Paul Dornan instructed us at the beginning. If you came in late, there are some index cards in your pews. He said they were there because he put them there. And so if you have questions, uh, if you've already filled out cards, if you could, if somebody could help me gather some cards and bring them forward, um, we want to spend some time uh, asking Dr. Cohn some questions and just continuing to benefit from his life, from his story, from his expertise, from his testimony. Uh, uh, we have been studying for these last several months the cross and lynching tree. It's been a very powerful, powerful experience. Uh, God is doing a new thing in Washington, D.C., and we are so grateful for it. And so, uh, Dr. Cohn, if you'd be so kind, we'd love for you to come forward, and, and uh, I'll, I'll moderate the question and answer time as Dr. Ginch has asked me to do. Um, the first one is, uh, Dr. Cohn, where do you see the church today working and speaking for justice? Where do we still need to go? Well, I wish I could see it more clearly than I do. Uh, the church, unfortunately, uh, is so focused on itself as an institution that events like this seldom happen because we are busy doing other things. But there are pockets of people who are wrestling with issues of justice and race and also poverty. And, you know, we just have to find where they are. And this is one place, because there's not many places you're gonna get such a diverse group as you have here tonight. It takes work to do that. And if we could get more people just in each other's presence, talking about issues that are very serious, then that's the beginning of the land, the foundation for really doing something 
to really change the world in which we live. I, I, I keep telling people that, you know, big things always start small and they grow. This could be one of the small things that grow into a big thing. Anytime you get diversity, talking on tough questions, which this society and the churches face, there is hope for humankind and hope for the church. How do you reconcile the historical legacy of white supremacy within the Christian faith with the spiritual practice of African Americans? Well, I, I think that the, the spiritual practice of African Americans is a practice that has come out of black people resist it. And that's the best. I think the best in the Christian faith is always that faith that is resisting injustice, resisting oppression. And that's why African American religious history as a Christian history, as of Christian people, is probably the most creative expression of the faith in the United States, not because of something in their biology, not because of something in skin color. It is because it is a faith that comes, that was born resisting, resisting oppression against a dominant group. And you know, that's the kind of faith that Jesus was talking about. It was a faith that was resisting during the time of the Roman Empire. And African American faith is a faith, it's best. Not all black churches are an expression of that faith. That's unfortunate. That's why I'm on the margin of the black church. The institution is not what I'm talking about. It is that I think if you want to see the best in black faith, it's expressed in the civil rights movement. The most transforming movement of social justice in the history of this land. And that's the best faith. That faith is the faith of freedom fighters. And that's what Jesus was, a freedom fighter. Jesus was a freedom fighter. And you cannot have an authentic Christian faith that's not fighting for freedom. There are a number of uh, questions that have come from our audience about the issue of incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to this and have you ever considered or would you ever consider lending your talent and voice to the issue of the disproportionate number of African Americans? Yes, I, I, you know, I wish, I wish I knew a lot of things. I, I just, I wish I had, I wish I had as much knowledge about blacks being incarcerated as Michelle Alexander had. That's the person that can talk to you about that. And, uh, but I also just served on a doctoral dissertation of one of my students at Union who just finished her degree this year, who has been working with incarcerated prisoners for about 10 years. I have another student who works at Sing Sing. He's been working there, he got his PhD with me. He's been working there for 20 years. So I see myself working through my students. 
and through others. If, if I, I, you know, you can't write on everything. If you do, it's not going to be very good. I don't have much longer on this earth. And if I go that route, I do talk about it because I talk about it a little in the, in the conclusion of my text. But I'm not an expert on that the way some of my students are. But yes, I would be glad to lend my voice. You just tell me where to go to talk. If Americans are hesitant or afraid of discussing race honestly, do you think it's the black or the white churches who are more afraid, or both? It's both. It's really both. Uh, and that's unfortunate. And they do it for different reasons. Whites do it because they don't want to remember that. They want to forget it. And they don't want to change what they're doing. So they don't really want real equality and justice. They really don't want that. They don't want to redistribute power now. They like tokenism but they're not going to give up that power. That's whites. Blacks got them a little power separate. They do. Founded in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. So there's power there. Ain't much. But it's more than they would have if they were with the whites. So they're not going to give that up either. So you got both. Don't want to change. And the churches are busy trying to survive. And you have to, and they forget what Jesus said. You know, you try to, you know, you try to save yourself, you lose yourself. You do. That's true of institutions and true of individuals. You try to save it and you lose it. And? Yes, thank you. Ah, yeah. I got a witness here. Yes. No, you, and that's, that's so serious, you know. We, we know it, but we don't want to do it. We know it, but we don't want to do it. And we get attached to institutions. We get attached to success. And for us, success is having these buildings and having these, oh boy, and electing each other to things and being important and all of that. That's why, you know, I'm an AME. At least, you know, on the margin. <laughs> they wouldn't have me do anything in that church. I tell you, because they don't know what I'm going to say. And I, <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> If I ever get a chance to say something to him. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. I, I love to get that chance, but don't worry. They're not going to let me speak in no general conference. <laughs> no, sir. Or any other important meeting they have. Because they know James Cone is going to say it like he sees it. And, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's, that's the problem, you see. That's the problem. And I learned a long time ago that if I'm going to do this and say what I think, I cannot want a whole lot of things. No status. You can't want a lot. 
I teach at Union. I, that's enough for me. Yeah, it is. It's enough for me. I got tenure. They can't do nothing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I yeah, they, you know, they don't like it either. No, they don't. Do you all see them projecting me out there as a symbol of what they are about? No. And that's good. I'm for that. I don't expect people to laud and praise and all that. I don't want it. Of course we all love to be loved. But love sent Jesus to the cross. And if we start following Jesus, we'll end up on crosses too. So, the church doesn't want to go to that cross, black or white. And I, if you read me, I'm as hard on the black church as I am on the white church. It's just the white church got more power. They can do more harm. The more power you have, the more harm you can do. And that's why the white church need to be critiqued and white theologians need to be critiqued. That's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. That's good. Racism is, in essence, stereotyping. Um, all members of a race possess certain characteristics. Your comments seem to fit that definition. For example, you said whites used to, excuse me, whites used faith to terrorize blacks. Yeah. The question this person has is, is that not racist? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I think racism has to do with power. And you, you, you switch the power and you'll get black racism. Yeah, you would. It has to do with power. It has nothing to do with biology. And that's why the redistribution of power is so essential. If you're not talking about redistributing power, you're just joking around. You just want to feel good. It's not about feeling good. It's about distributing power. And people don't want to do that. That's why. The Senate in the city, that's white power right there. That's what it is. White power. And people can have it and smile at you at the same time. That's what I tell the people at Union. That's white power. Because whites have all the power. All they have to do is vote. That's why they love democracy, at least for a moment. But soon, they're going to figure out a way so democracy won't count. But yes, when you terrorize people, that's racism. And I think any people would do it if they have the power to do it. You point out that America's lynching history has receded from our collective historical memory. Yet when it is discussed in our universities and public institutions, it is often stripped of religious context. What do we lose? What do we lose by secularizing our conversation about lynching? Well, I, I think I think one thing we lose, we fail to realize, is that, uh, is that, is that people who did lynching were thought of themselves as Christians. That's the terrible thing about it. They thought of themselves as Christians. And uh, uh, when you can do that in the name of God, 
You can do almost anything. And the way you do that is to define the people you are lynching as not fully human. That's how you do it. Not fully human. And, and that's, you know, that's how white Americans were able to enslave people for two, hundred, two and a half centuries. They weren't fully human. They were, they were they subhuman. And they had scientists at Harvard and other major universities telling them that's the case, that blacks were subhuman. And they had theologians using the Bible. Some used the Cain and Abel story. Some used Noah and the curse of Ham. They used all kinds of things to make blacks subhuman and Native Americans subhuman, so they could do to them what they want. When people want to do it to you, they will use their reason, their intellect, to justify whatever they do. So, this is why it's so important for people to learn how to be self-critical to look at themselves at how others see them. And then we might be able to grow, but redistribution of power is the essence of social change. That's good. We're gonna take about 10 more minutes, is that okay? Okay, all right. And then give, give, that'll give time for okay, book right. signing and, and give you a break from, okay. all right, from the, uh, okay. if that's all right. All right, uh, okay. Um, how do you see a black theology speaking to this present Facebook generation. This present what? Facebook generation. Oh, Facebook. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know nothing about Facebook. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I really don't. I really don't. I never, you know, I never went on it. I never been on it. I never seen it. You know, I do have a, I do have a, 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 a thing. <laughs> but I don't use it. I just, I know, I'm, I'm really in the old thing. I never, I've never tweeted. <laughs> Y'all tweet? I never, so I don't know. You need to bring another theologian <laughs> of, of this generation. I'm, I'm really of another generation. <laughs> All right. Um. Where do you see points of resonance? Where do you see points of resonance, resonance between your black liberation theology narrative and that of other racial ethnic experiences? And who are some of your peers we should be reading and uh, learning from? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I, it's very important for people and especially for theologians, but as people generally, to always uh, be in a diverse racial and all kinds of uh, communities. I was a member, my first contact with people of other racial and ethnic, not only in this country, but also all over the world, we founded what is called the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. 1976, we met first in Tanzania, then we met in Ghana, and then we met in uh, Sri Lanka, and then we met in Brazil, and then we met in India, and then we met in Geneva, and we went back to Kenya. So we met. We, these were theologians from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and also U.S. minorities talking together about our theologies and how we can learn from each other and how we can learn to come together and make a theology which we all can participate in. And we did that. We did that for over a period of 20 years. And they are still going on. But also in this country, we also did it here just among U.S. minorities here, Asian, 
African Americans, Hispanic, and Native Americans. We founded what is called the Theology in the Americas in 1975. We met in Detroit twice, 1975 and 1980, and we continued to carry on these dialogues. In fact, I just came back from a dialogue of racial ethnics at the University of Chicago, in Chicago, on the campus of the University of Chicago, just, you know, this past April, about a month ago. And there we came together, each of us talking about our experience and our people and our religion and our theology. All other groups have begun to find their voices as well. I teach a course at Union Seminary called Foundations in Christian Theology. And in that course, I cover all these other theologies, not only just Native American, Asians, African Americans, and, and Indians, but also LGBT, and you know, all other kinds of things, Africa, Asia, Latin America. So I think, that we need to always move outside of our comfortable space and reach out and share in other people's experiences. Because if what you are saying only speaks to you and to nobody else, then you want to examine that again because your own particularity should move beyond itself and reach out to others because our particularity should be pointing to a universality which others are pointing to too. The reason why I emphasize black so much cause I'm black. That's where I start. And I don't want a universalism that doesn't have my name on it. But it's going to have a lot of other names on it. And unless we get together, as we are coming together here tonight, we can never really bear witness to that common humanity that we say we believe in. So these other groups and other peoples are so essential for our own humanity because I always say, if you're going to struggle with me, I want you to struggle because you see my struggle as a part of your struggle. And as you see that we are all struggling for the same thing. Dr. Cohn, last question. Okay, Thank last you. Question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how do you handle holding back the tears and pain that you still see and feel? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question because The Cross and the Lynching Tree especially was a painful book to write. And it's not easy to talk about it. And uh, that's why I'm so pleased that you came. It's like listening to my grief, my pain, my suffering, my, my struggle. And in that listening, I feel your support, your support. And that's what enables me to endure the pain and the tears and the hurt because I know I'm not alone. And when you know you are not alone, you can 
you can go through a lot of things. See, and that's, that's, you know, people always ask how, how, you know, one thing is that Jesus was always there with the people. And where I grew up, they say you can call him up on the telephone of prayer. And he's always there. His line is never busy, they said. And tell him what you want. And you know, when you're going through stuff, and I remember growing up in Beard and Arkansas, I really, I just really felt loved by the people, by my mother, my father, and other people in Macedonia at school, at home. I just felt love, and it was like God's love coming through them. And when you are loved, you can, you can take it. You can fight. And you won't give up because you are bearing witness to something that is much greater than you. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of all assembled, Dr. Cohn. I'm Linda Lader on the pastoral staff here at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, and I'm actually standing in for Reverend Karen Brow of Luther Place because she isn't here with us tonight because of her father's death this week. So be praying for her, please, and her family. Dr. Cohn, one of the many things that you said that sticks with me is you said the cross is not good news for the powerful, for those who are comfortable with the way things are. And I pray we are not comfortable, and I think all of you are here tonight because you are not comfortable with the way things are. So before I give the benediction, I have some invitations for you. One is this, that about which Paul spoke, building the momentum. These are just suggestions and where we start, but I invite you to do as many of these or other similar things that you can so that we may keep going. Dr. Cohn said we need to get into each other's presence. These are some ways of doing it, and I know we'll find many, many more. Another invitation is for you to stay and continue the conversation. We have refreshments, and we want you to get acquainted with each other and keep talking tonight. But we can't stay here all night. So uh, our friend Glenn Zuber and his wife Jen Butler have suggested a place where we might reconvene a few blocks from here. I'm, I'm telling you the name because that's the name. It's called the Laughing Man Tavern. I know there will be laughing women there as well. They're not totally enlightened there, but whatever, we can still go. The Laughing Man Tavern, it's on G Street between 13th and 14th, right across from uh, Epiphany Episcopal Church, I believe. We have no tables reserved. We are just the public. We will go and commandeer our own space and continue the conversation. So now, good people, people who are loved, go forth in hope. Go forth with commitment and courage and conviction and compassion as healers, agents of healing and truth tellers. And may the God of peace who brought forth from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
by the blood of the eternal covenant, complete you with everything that is good that you may be pleasing in the sight of our crucified and risen God, to whom be glory now and forever. Hallelujah. Amen. There will also be book signing in the rear. <laughs>